Yeah, my name's Mike Hall and I'm the, the manager of the Goblin Laboratory of Paleoclimate Research, Department of Earth Sciences, Cambridge University. I started working in this department in uh, 1963 uh, with working in the radiocarbon dating laboratory originally and then in 1969 I moved over to work with uh, Nicholas Shackleton after he's got his PhD as his research assistant and, and I've been doing work with uh, in this field of climatology since 1969 up until the present time. Uh, and I worked with Nick from 2000 until 2006 when he died. When I started together there was just two of us working in, in an old Nissan hut uh, near to Cambridge Station um, and uh, with one very old mass spectrometer. Uh, and uh, when I joined him in 69 um, we managed to improve that mass spectrometer so it was able to analyse smaller samples uh, and analyse them more quickly and uh, more precisely and then subsequently we developed other equipment we were, so we were able to analyse much smaller samples as well and uh, basically that method that uh, we uh, produced in the 1970s and 80s is still used today in most cases for doing this particular sort of analysis. We've managed to get back uh, uh, in, uh, in time uh, for thousands and millions of years looking at past climate change uh, and a lot of Nick's work has been related to the Milankovitch theory uh, with the Earth's orbit around the Sun. We've been able to prove the Milankovitch theory. Uh, we've looked at a mapping of the, of the oceans uh, at the last glacial and uh, Nick has continued do, will continue doing lots of work with regard to that um, right up to his death. These are cores which we're going to analyse and uh, what happens is when the boat goes out it drills into the ocean bed. So as it drills into the ocean bed it brings up a very long core, often something like 10 metres long. Uh, but it's difficult to handle a 10 metre long core. So this is cut into sections of one and a half metres. And then uh, on the boat they are split in half. So you'll see that uh, it came out as a cylinder but what you'll be seeing is like a piece of guttering with the sample laying in the gutter and that is half the core. You'll be able to see some sort of stratification of where the sediment has been settling over the years on the core. It's a general sediment that's been in the oceans and it will contain uh, both uh, planktic and benthic foraminifera which is the thing that we want to look at in order to get the isotope ratios out of this in order to look at climate change. While the shells are living uh, then they're taken in this chemical composition and then they die after their three or four weeks and drop to the bottom of the ocean. So they build up a sediment. So you're going, by drilling into the core, you're going back in time. So as you go back in time, you can then go down a core and take samples from it. And then you get a relationship between time and past climate change. Once we have some good relationship between the past climate, then it's hopeful that by knowing what happened in the past, we'll be able to predict what's going to happen in the future. There are three main parts to the mass spectrometer. Uh, there's the, the source, uh, the flight tube and the magnet and the collector arrangement and uh, you can see that they go around in, a, in an arc and so your CO2 gas which we're going to produce from our samples uh, is uh, put into the mass spectrometer in what's called the source and here the gas is ionized and this is done by heating um, a, uh, a filament and a beam of electrons goes in a sort of spiral across a box and it ionizes or knocks off electrons from various um, molecules that are inside the, the box. Uh, these molecules are then accelerated with a potential difference or a voltage of about four and a half thousand volts. So they will be drawn out of the source by this potential difference and into the flight tube of the mass spectrometer. Um, they go through the magnetic field. Without the magnetic field they would continue in a straight line. But with the magnetic field it will bend them round depending on the mass of the molecule or mass of the iron. So the heavier masses will be bent less than the lighter ones. So you would get a spectrum of, of, of mass numbers. And so we need to pick on three of these, mass numbers 44, 45 and 46, to look at the oxygen and carbon isotopes. And these are collected by uh, the collector arrangement, which are three gold buckets. And these gold buckets actually measure the instant number of molecules on them, and they turn this into a current. So you're looking at very small currents, which you are comparing, depending on the number of instant molecules from each particular mass number. Well, if we look at mass numbers 44 and 46, these are the two isotope ratio, uh, isotope numbers 016 and 018, and we look at the ratio between these two, which uh, gives us an indication of the temperature of the seawater where this animal was living when it died. Uh, 44 and 45 uh, look at the carbon ratio between C12 and C13, and this bears a relationship to the atmospheric CO2 while the animal was living. Samples can be taken down the core. Uh, and uh, we can go back in time as we go down the core 
and so we will be able to plot out the values that we're getting from uh, the machine, from the mass spectrometer, the isotope values we're getting, against time. So as we go back, you'll be able to see how the climate has changed. Uh, we can go back uh, to millions of years looking at past climate change, and uh, the, the printout comes out at the end of uh, a, r a run of each particular sample. And this will give us uh, an idea of the difference, 10 differences between a reference and the sample. So we have uh, a list of uh, differences uh, that are taken by the machine automatically and it automatically takes them a mean value of these differences over the run of 10, 10 uh, differences and prints us out that value and a standard deviation. Uh, so we can see that the measurements are good. Uh, this value that we've got then has to be calibrated by using our standard samples which we've put in throughout the run to the international standard VPDB. So this can be compared with uh, other people's results and also so we can compare our results from day to day. So as you go down a core, using samples uh, consecutively down the core, we can see how the climate may have changed.